Nice. You guys want to say hello? So we're in the Truebed house uh, in Marin, north of San Francisco, with the full team. Uh, Robbie, Harley, Matt, uh, Sammy. We got Fred back there as well. Hello. And uh, Jason wow. walking down the stairs. <laughs> that is awesome. I had no idea. Yeah, it's a big showing. Yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> I'm I'm trying to figure out how how how's our bounty thing doing. Hey guys. Hey Hudson. Is there a uh, are you are are you going to uh oh I, I think they will send the links. Uh, and I, uh, are you going to set up a recording thing and or, or, can, can you figure out how to record and live stream it? So I can't live stream it because the internet connection at my Airbnb is not good enough. But what I can do is record it. So I'm going to record it, but I'll have to be on mute for like most of the time. Okay. Cool. Also, we both, both teams have recorded demos uh, in advance. Um, of the TrueBit piece working and then of, of the um, Doge submitter and agent also. So we've sent those links to you via email. So in addition to this recording, we can send those out because it's more of a, a deep dive demo. Okay. If you Perfect. Like yeah, so the other Great. one we so took go, 20 minutes. Go ahead, guys, whatever you want. Yeah, we took 20 minutes to demo it on Rink B and send the transactions live and we'll do we'll do something similar on this call. Perfect. Cool. So with that, you guys, uh, do you, the judges maybe want to give a quick, you know, 30 second intro, who everybody is, and then uh, we'll just kick off. Okay. So do you think that everyone, uh, oh, should we, should we start? Should we wait more? I think it's O3. I'm not sure who is here already and who is not, but here's an overview. Okay. So I am Alex Bandesande and I've been with Ethereum since a long time. I've helped set up the original bounty contract, which now has about 1,491,000 ,001 eaters, which used to be a lot more last week, but hey, it's that <laughs> this is crypto. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm, I, I, I basically helped set that up back then because I thought it would be a good project and I sort of that's how, how I got involved. And I believe right now we are talking about a bounty of distributing about 20, 25% of that, right? So that would be about 372 eaters, which is, I don't know how, what's the price, but about $300,000, I would say with the current price or something like that. So this is the this is the mostly the goal of this meeting is to figure out if those if if all those guys out there in in the teams have have done a, a good job on actually worked on the on the bridge they promised they would would be working on and if so I I would be super happy to start uh, start a request and see those those little dodges start rolling down bridge and crossing the crossing the river. <laughs> I I even try I, I, I have to say I, I try to make a little a little Shiba you know image for this for this meeting but I but I I didn't go through with it but so I I might still do it I might still do a little Shiba you know crossing a bridge for for this so that's nice. it for my introduction awesome Okay, I'll dive in. Uh, hi, I'm Ross. I'm one of the Dogecoin developers. Uh, I'm really excited to see this. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, sorry, if I'm flicking over to the right, this is me reading the background material. So I haven't really had enough time to prep. I do apologize to everyone. But yeah, so I'm looking this way. Uh, it's me reading background material, but it looks really exciting. And uh, yeah, hey, good luck, everyone. I, I can I'll go just next. Continue here. Oh, sorry. I'll go ahead. <laughs> Uh, I guess I'll just continue because I'm the other half of the Dogecoin core development team that's active right now. Um, I'm Max, also known as Lange Hans. And yeah, I don't have anything else to say, I guess, but I'm just really excited to see this project going along. 
Okay, cool. So um, I'm Hudson. I uh, am on the multi-sig for the Doge uh, Ether Bridge contract, and I work at the Ethereum Foundation doing some internal communication, Reddit moderating, website redesign, documentation, and a bunch of other cool stuff. So I'm real excited to see this, and uh, yeah, I'm recording this. So uh, because I'm like recording environment, I might have to put myself on mute for the rest of the time, but just know I'm cheering you guys on. Awesome. Thanks, guys. So I think with that, Oscar, uh, let's get started. There's Christian. Hi, Christian. Nice to see you. Hi, oh, and make sure, did, did Piper introduce himself? Is Piper here? I'm here. I am Piper. Uh, I run the Python team at the foundation and have been around for a while. I'm on the multi-sig and I'm really excited to see that little pile of ether potentially go somewhere after all of these months and years. <laughs> Christian, all the judges are introducing themselves. So why, why don't you make it the honor? Yeah, let's, uh, we, we prepare a presentation. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes, uh, I, I was waiting for you just to see if Christian could, could also make a quick introduction. Not that he needs okay. one, but just say hello. Hi, I'm Christian. I, I'm, I'm not a judge, right? So, because. Are you, are you here as a participant then? <laughs> I think you contributed yeah. some code. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Awesome. Shall we start then? Yeah. Yeah, let's do it. Cool. So, okay, let's, um, let's start with uh, how we plan the agenda for the call. The idea is to first introduce ourselves and review the objectives and the stages of the project. And uh, then we will explain uh, the solution uh, we created and do a demo of it. And we plan to do our thing in 30, mi in 30 minutes. And then you will have as much time as you want for questions and answers. So thanks for being here. Um, my name is Oscar, and I started working on this project in August. Uh, before this, I built a two-way peg for RSK. Uh, when I started the project, I thought, I could build the entire thing by myself, but soon after that, I realized it was a bit, a bit, a little bit more complicated, and I realized that we needed like a multidisciplinary team. Uh, and I found Trubit was already working solving a key part of this um, problem, and so we joined Trubit, Confabric, and I. Um, so now I will let uh, Sina, Trubit, and Pablo Confabric. Fabric to introduce themselves and their team. Maybe Sina, you can start. Sure. So I'm Sina uh, from Trubit. We're here with the whole team. Uh, Christian also contributed in a massive way to this project. And uh, we're, um, we really come in in the piece. So for this chain, for this bridge to work, uh, the Ethereum smart contract that we'll get into needs to verify Dogecoin's proof of work, which is the S script function. And uh, that is both memory hard and computationally intensive in a way that doesn't fit within the Ethereum blockcast limit. So we've built a, uh, we've implemented Trubit um, specific to the S-Script program and uh, are going to demo it on Rinkby. Pablo? I'm Pablo, uh, I started Confabric in 2014, uh, working in different blockchain uh, projects, especially in Ethereum. I'm we work with uh, Oscar with RSK to build uh, their bridge, uh, and that's why he approached us to to work for this bounty. And uh, is Ismael, he, he was uh, the developer who was working uh, with Oscar side by side in in RSK bridge. And Katarina. I'm a junior developer at Trainfabric and I've been working mostly on the dot relay part of the of the bridge product. Um, but yeah, I didn't start all that long ago, so it's not much of a yeah, that. Cool. Uh, 
Cool. Uh, so I will. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah. Ah, cool. Right. So let's continue with. Yeah, they can. Okay, uh, that's Tim. Uh, now let's review the objective of the bounty. The idea is to create a fully decentralized uh, bridge between Dogecoin and Ethereum. Uh, many people also refer to it as a two-way peg. Uh, when I discuss a project with some people, many many people ask me if this is kind of a decentralized exchange or kind of atomic swap. Uh, those are different things to what we are doing because uh, in the bridge, the two-way peg we are creating, we are not converting one coin to another, but we are moving coins from one blockchain to another. So on the Dogecoin to Ethereum side, we allow users to move coins on the Dogecoin blockchain to an ERC-20 contract, which we call Doge token. And then the second part which is Ethereum to Dogecoin. We allow token holder to get their Dogecoin back on the Dogecoin blockchain. Um, so, as I said, well, the project has two big parts, Dogecoin to Ethereum and Ethereum to Dogecoin, and we would like to map uh, like project stages to boundary payments. So using the feedback Alex gave me, um, I, we, we are presenting this proposal, and uh, today we are just presenting the Doge to Ethereum side, uh, since uh, that part is not complete. Uh, we are not asking the entire 50%, but just 25%. Cool. Uh, let's review the, the solution. Uh, are there any questions so far? No. Okay, I guess there aren't. Cool. So no, uh, this is kind of a... Sorry? Maybe okay. So, sorry. Um, so this is kind of the big picture of the solution. Uh, on one end, that's the Dogecoin blockchain, and on the other end, there is the Doge token contract. So if a user wants to send money from Dogecoin to Ethereum, uh, she will have to create a Dogecoin transaction sending funds to a special address uh, that uh, we call the lock address. And then we have this piece of software we call Doge Submiteration, which is constantly monitoring the Dogecoin blockchain for new transactions. And once it finds a transaction to this special address, it will relay that transaction to the Doge Relay. The Doge Relay will do a couple of checks and then notify Doge Token that there's a new transaction. And Doge Token will mint the same amount of, uh, let's say, three Doge were sent, it will mint three new Doge tokens minus fee. Um, so, Dosh Relay, in order before sending uh, the, the transaction to Dosh Token, needs to have needs to do a couple of checks. Uh, the most important one is to make sure that the transaction uh, is part of the Dogecoin blockchain and it's not made up. So, in order to do that, Dosh Relay needs a copy of the Dogecoin blockchain in the smart contract. Actually, it does not need the entire blockchain, but just the headers. So Dodge submiteration will not, not only relay transactions, but also the Dogecoin block headers. So when Dodge Relay receives a Dogecoin block header, it will check its slash sheet and it will add it to its copy of the Dogecoin blockchain. The thing is, one of the checks that needs to be done is to validate the proof of work. To do that, uh, we need to execute script, but as uh, Sina was saying before, uh, if you try to do that on chain, uh, it will need like 300 million units of gas. So we integrated Dosh Relay to the script um, interactive uh, verification um, protocol that Rubit created. So before we uh, Dosh Relay adds um, a header to its copy of the blockchain, it will send a header and a proposed hash to, to the Trubit contract. And after some time, the Trubit contract will reply the the block is OK, and the Dodge Relay contract will add it to its copy of the blockchain. Um, 
now uh, I will pass on to Sina. He will explain how, in more detail, how the Truly protocol works. I, I have a question before we, we go on. Yeah, sure. Uh, might be done, but how do we check that the how do we check that the headers represent the latest version of the Dodge Dodge blockchain? Right. So uh, I mean, the, the Dodge relay has a copy of uh, of the Dodge blockchain. So uh, as new blocks come in, they are being added to the to the blockchain. So um, in order for a block to be valid, it has to be connected. To the previous, um, uh, to, to the previous block in the blockchain, and also anyone can submit a block to Dodge Relay. So eventually, all the blocks are being submitted. If anyone is submitted invalid blocks, they will be discarded, either because they don't they break a rule that Dodge Relay can check, or because it breaks a, a rule that script um, that uh, that Ruby can check. I don't know if that okay. answers the question. Okay, so let me let me see if I if I can explain it back to you. So basically, what happens is that I submit I will submit a, a block and let let and if I submit a block that is has a larger that is sorry a fork of the Dogecoin, then what it will happen is that someone else can can later submit another block there and the you will be able to verify that that new block has a higher uh, proof of work than the one that I had submitted, therefore mine is invalid. Is that it? Yes, it is because uh, Dodge Relay, uh, it's kind of a Dodge Kernel. It's just a lot similar to the Dodge Kernel. So it can uh, know what uh, blockchain is the best uh, is the best chain and what part of the blockchain are forced uh, because of the proof of work. Okay. Does that yeah, that answers my question. Cool. Any other questions before we move on? Um, yes, actually. Um, I wanted to ask sort of in that same vein in terms of chain reorgs on the Dodge coin chain side. Um, is there anything in there built in to handle? Like, um, I don't really know what the timeline here is, but but is it possible for uh, temporary small side chains to be validated and potentially coins to be issued through there and then the chain reorg happens and those headers are no longer valid and how is that handled or is it? Right, so uh, that's a valid attack on the system. Um, so to avoid that attack, what uh, we request uh, to a transaction before minting the tokens is to have a number of confirmation, not just one confirmation. That's what I. That's exactly what I was curious about. That answers my question. The, the exact number of of headers that we will request in the production environment, it will be kind of a trade-off between how long we want to make users to wait and how costly is an attack of creating fake blocks. Uh, but yes, we do have um, a request, um, I mean, transactions aren't relayed until they have, let's say, 10 or 100 confirmations. Sounds good, thanks. Um, more questions? Okay, so I guess I'll take it over from here. Uh, so, um, so, like Oscar said, one of the main things that the Doge Relay contract needs to do is verify the proof of work provided with one of these block headers, and that involves. Um, um, I'm really sorry to, inter to, to interrupt you. I forgot to do one important thing that I have to do before you start, which is yeah. sending the last transaction that I will need in the demo. Yeah. Of okay. <laughs> before uh, moving to Sina. Um, Let's go to my Dosh client. Um, I'm going to send a transaction to the log address. I have to do this before uh, Sina continues because if not, uh, uh, the transaction won't confirm in time. So let me copy the address. Uh, so this is the address. 
I'm gonna send like 293 fully fully gosh, right? Okay, that's actually sent. Then confirm. Oh. That's all. Mina, you're good to go. Then we will go back to the point. Okay, just oh, yeah. quick question. Uh, w which address were you sending to? You were just sending to a custom address that blocks it, right? It's not any particular yeah. address. Well, uh, nowadays we are sending uh, to an address that actually it is actually a burn address because uh, it's, we only have those two Ethereum side. We are burning Dosh as we get the tokens. Uh, to be more technical, the address that uh, you just saw is the address that match that matches the pub, uh, public key hash tree, which is impossible to to get a private key that matches that. So it's we are basically burning Dosh coins for so fire. Sorry, Sina. Okay. Sweet. So yeah, so like Oscar was saying, one of the main things that this Doge Relay contract needs to do in verifying uh, a Doge header is to check its proof of work. And Doge's proof of work is the Escript function. Uh, Doge was a fork of Lucky Coin, which is a fork of Litecoin, and uh, uh, because of that, they they all use Escript. And um, Escript is a memory hard and computationally intensive function that involves 2,050 steps of the Salsa eight hashing function executed one after another and because of that it can't be it doesn't fit within the ethereum gas limit and this contract can't simply uh take the plain text header fields uh run the function on them get the script hash and com compare them with the proof of work value provided and check that it's correct so um this made it a perfect use case for truebit which is what we've built so i'm gonna just share my screen now Okay, can you guys see everything? Is that, a, is that a yes? Yes. Okay, so we're, this is the, the GitHub repo for our project, github.com slash Trubit Foundation slash Script Interactive. And uh, we have this schematic of the protocol that I'm just going to walk you through. So there are two main uh, participants in, in this protocol. There's the Trubit claimant up here and the Trubit verifier. So just to kind of help orient you, this is the Doge blockchain up here uh, with new blocks getting created and everything below this line is happening inside of Ethereum. So the Trubit claimant um, is the person who, you know, provides a block header and claims that the, the script hash was correctly calculated from the plain text fields. They're providing, they're sending this transaction into the Doge relay contract which actually just passes it on to the claim manager contract. So everything, everything within this light green box over here is the Trubit protocol. So, so um, this calls a function called check script and um, really what it passes in, at this point where we've abstracted away, we don't really care that this is a block header that we're talking about anymore. We just care that there's a plain text uh, field, there's a hash and uh, the, the the Doge Relay contract also passes a proposal ID, which um, we'll include in our callback to them. And um, this claim gets created here. So at this point, this claimant has staked their, their, their uh, reputation and deposit in saying that um, this particular hash was correctly calculated from this plain text. Now, since you're within the Trubit protocol, these verifiers down here are, is anyone who's running a Trubit client on their computer. And these clients are configured to be listening for events inside the claim manager contract. And as a, as a new claim gets created, what these guys do is uh, basically take that plain text, locally uh, run it through the script function, uh, get the hash, compare it with the value in the claim. And if they agree, then, then there's no problem. They just kind of let the claim sit there. And each claim kind of has this timer that's counting down. So if it goes for a certain number of blocks without getting challenged, uh, it's deemed correct. And the claim manager contract at that point makes a script verified callback to, to the Doge Relay saying that this proposal was deemed correct. Um, but in the more interesting case, the verifier actually finds an issue with the hash and they find that they disagree. So at that point, they, 
they submit a challenge. They say challenge claim. And um, so the contract, the claim manager contract knows that there's a disagreement on what's happened here. So at this point, this kicks off uh, to the script verifier contract um, saying, you know, using the function claim computation, passing in the input, output, claimant, challenger, and the claim ID, which is kind of its uh, unique ID. So this again is another layer of abstraction, which is the, the input is, is the plain text that was passed in. The output is the output of the program, which is the hash. The claimant and the challenger are the two addresses. And um, so if you think about, think back to the, the, or the generic TrueBit protocol as described in the white paper, um, I won't get into all those details, but, but the, that TrueBit protocol allows you to include uh, what the program is. So it's more generic. It's like I claim that this, this output was generated from this input after being run through this particular program. Um, but in this particular case, we know up front that the program is script. So this is the script verifier contract instead of a generic, you know, uh, TrueBit contract, which is able to run uh, any WebAssembly file. So this, uh, at, at the point that this arrives, a verification game begins between the verifier and the claimant. And so I'll just give an overview of what happens here, which is, which is one of the interesting parts of the TrueBit protocol. It's, it's an interactive game that, um, uh, that allows most of the computation to be performed off-chain with uh, one final step calculated on-chain. We, we, the insight here is that the verifiers and the claimant, um, or the particular verifier who's involved in this game, um, they actually agreed at time zero when they began running this program. So they had the same inputs and they had the same script function. So they agreed at time zero, and then after 2050 steps, they disagreed because they had different outputs. So the verifier sends a query in. So the game, the interactive game involves multiple rounds of query and response from the claimant. Um, the verifier sends a query in saying, I know we agreed in the beginning. I know we disagreed at step 2050. What was what was your entire state at the halfway mark? So what was your the Merkle root of the state of your virtual machine at step 1024? And um, the claimant calculates that response with, with step and Merkle root. Um, now this is sitting in here. The verifier again now compares their own state root at step 1024 with the one provided by the claimant. Now they, they, they can deduce, they can make the deduction here and that if their state roots agree, they know that the error occurred, um, that they basically agreed from step one to step 1024. So the error, the disagreement occurred in the second half of the computation. If their uh, state roots are disagree at this point already, they know that the disagreement occurred in the first half of the computation. So then the verifier with that knowledge either queries for step for the midpoint of you know, step 1024 and 2050, or they query for the midpoint of step zero and step 1025. So they basically break the computation into another half there. Um, the claimant does the calculation response. The verifier, again, does the same computation, queries another midpoint. So if you take this game to its conclusion, basically it's a binary search that's going from step zero to the final step, narrowing down the window of disagreement till it, till, till it lands on the first step at which both of the, the verifier and claimant had the exact same state route. They ran one round of the salsa aid function, and then they disagreed uh, on the state after that. At that point, the, the computation is small enough that the script verifier actually runs it on chain. So you get the full security of the Ethereum network um, inside of here. Uh, all the miners uh, execute the code. Uh, in this case, it would be on Rinkeby. They, uh, they get their state, calculate the root, and compare it with what the claimant had provided in this final step. So if, um, if the root that the contract calculated agrees with the root that the claimant provided, then they know that the claimant was telling the truth. So this session decided callback goes back here, saying that the claimant was the winner and the challenger was the loser. Um, in the case where the roots disagreed, the script verifier sends the callback saying that the challenger was the winner and the claimant was the loser. 
So this is the this protocol is crypto economic in the sense that both the verifier and the claimant had to have deposits inside the claim manager contract. So when the game resolves, uh, one of them gets slashed, and um, and uh, that's basically it. And so if if the claimant was proven correct, this you know claim is deemed you know incorrect, and the Doge relay never the Doge relay never receives the callback, so it never ends up adding that. Um, block header back, uh, block header to its, you know, list of uh, Doge headers. If the claim lives long enough and goes long enough without a challenge um, and wins against all challengers, then this callback is made saying that the script was verified. So effectively, this protocol allows, um, allows you to run the script function within Ethereum. And uh, so I'll just go back here. So... Um, Yeah, so this um, so this is interesting to us for for a number of reasons. First, it kind of acts as a um, as a proof of concept for for the generic Truvit protocol, which would allow you to run anything on Ethereum. In this particular case, we've narrowed it to S scripts. Um, moreover, it's kind of like a cool you know demonstration of how this binary search would work, and is like just a, an interesting demo of the protocol. And lastly, it's helped us kind of, so we have, just to be clear, we have a security assumption in here that um, both, um, I guess I'll just go back here again, um, that both the claimant and the verifier are, are altruistic. So they're participating in this system without any expectation of profit. Uh, so in, in the generic Truebit protocol, everyone is kind of brought into this economy um, with the expectation of gain. And uh, the way that's achieved is there's rewards that are provided, and there's this forced error mechanism that uh, occasionally pays a pays a jackpot out to the challenger. So um, that's th that stuff is needed to 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 build the generic Truebit protocol, but it adds uh, a number of you know more nuanced economic attack vectors that you need to protect against. And uh, in this particular system, where uh, we're basically assuming that people are doing this altruistically. So with that, I'll open it up to questions and let me know. Okay, okay. Uh, my, first question. my first question. So, so to what I understand, to what I understand you, you build in Solidity or somehow in EVM, you build a... Uh, uh, You've built the script computation in EVM or Solidity, right? So that's that's one of the assumptions. And the idea is that true bit you could you could it can be a true bit, but it can be a script. But it could be other things, right? So any any other sort of other sort of computation you could do like a single step on the EVM. Yeah. So so the the so, sorry yeah go ahead. No oh, yeah that that's a that's one question that. that yeah so. So the Truebit protocol described in the white paper is able to run any WebAssembly um, module uh, on chain on Ethereum. And it does that by playing this binary search game in the instructions available in, in like the bytecode of that WebAssembly module. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's what the generic protocol allows you to do. In this particular case, we've taken the same idea, implemented uh, scripts in in the EVM, so there's, uh, if you look inside of the GitHub repo, there are a number of the contracts that deal with computing a script. And um, Christian actually wrote the code for this uh, originally. Uh, and uh, basically you play the binary search game over each round of each round of the Salsa 8 uh, hash function. Okay, second question. So the risk we are facing here, since, since, since of course all the members are altruistic, is that there's always a chance that for some reason there are no verifiers online. Maybe for and um, and so a claim could be put there that isn't true. It's just that nobody checked, no, nobody cared to check because no nobody was online, right? Yeah. So um, yeah. So in in the in the tr in the actual Truebit protocol, you as a verifier stand the chance of coming across a forced error and getting a large jackpot, and that's what incentivizes mm -hmm. you to basically show up for every claim. 
Uh, in, this, in this current iteration of this project, we're making the assumption that the nodes are altruistic. And, um, you know, it kind of, this goes hand in hand with, with the design we use for the return peg. So from Ethereum to Doge, because there are different proposals there. The simplest one being, you know, a federated peg, which also relies on, on, on you know, trust and altruism. Um, but um, so just to, just as a short tangent, um, we're developing a, uh, we're developing the Truebit incentive layer, which basically adds incentive to all of these network participants as kind of uh, as a separate module that can overlay any verification game. So in parallel, as that gets developed, uh, this escrow verification could use the same kind of security guarantees. All right, good. And also Jason's over here, so we can hear Yeah, us. hi. I just wanted to elaborate a little bit on Stina's, uh, the, the security assumptions. Um, and why they're realistic to have an altruistic model. First, first, first of all, um, anyone can jump in and challenge. So even though they're altruistic, any altruistic node can jump in and create a challenge. So that's open. The second thing is that unlike Truebit, which we imagine is like a scalable computer that could handle, in theory, an unbounded number of incoming tasks, we're only gonna have a small number of tasks, which is like however many, basically one task per block from Dogecoin. So that makes it, um, it's a bound that can be handled on a single computer. And therefore, if there's at least one honest person, we don't have to worry about it ever blowing up to something that they couldn't do on a laptop. So that's, that's it. Yeah, I was gonna say, it sounds like we could actually readily run this on existing Dogecoin infrastructure anyway, because we have various nodes just to make sure there's a backbone and you know, doing a, a single script function per Dogecoin block is not an expensive operation. Uh, I mean, it sounds like this is going to run, probably there'll be a lot of activity when we, when we launch, and then it will go quiet, and this can just become a background task. And honestly, it sounds like you know, we'll have people probably running Raspberry Pis in their garage, and eventually you know, a couple of thousand dollars appears in their Raspberry Pi, and they go, oh, crud, what do I do with this sort of thing, you know? Uh, cool. And, it, and just to add to that, so one of the core properties of Truebit is you're kind, you're kind of achieving consensus on the result of this computation, but Truebit really has what we call a unanimous consensus model. So as long as there's one honest verifier in the entire network, uh, that will be enough to, to catch uh, you know, wrong claims. So like Jason said, because the scale of the program, because of the way it's structured, you, uh, you just need you know, a few honest nodes running on the network to, to get it working. You know, we'll leave his Keep computer on. Right. Don't everything is safe. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I would just add that if if some sort of incentivization mechanism is actually needed or some sort of funding, we could we can also consider at the end of the whole process to leave let's say ten percent of the bounties to to be paid to to those who are running and maintaining the system. I think that. That, that would be a fair use of the bounties, in my opinion. Of course, oh, actually, other judges it, might. No. Agreed. <laughs> um, we still have uh, the, the demo. Uh, do there, are there any other questions about this in particular? We, we still have an open uh, room for questions at the end. Nope, no questions so far. OK, so let's. Go back to uh, sharing my screen. Okay, and here. Um, okay, so next thing we the to demonstrate the system working. Um, probably you remember a couple of minutes ago I sent a transaction on Dosh on the Dogecoin blockchain to this log address, and I sent two hundred and eighty three. Dosh, sorry, milli Dosh. Uh, there is one Dosh fee, so but I actually just sent one. Uh, sorry, point two hundred and eighty-three. Uh, now, what I, the, the thing that I'm going to demo is once you send the transaction, how you see that you uh, get the tokens. So I'm going to open this transaction on a Dosh Block Explorer. Right. 
So I can see there are inputs and outputs, the output of 0.283. Now the interesting thing that I need here is the input address. So I will copy the input address because this is the input, uh, uh, this is the address that um, that is the one that um, that matches the private key that sends the funds. And that private key should be the owner of the tokens on the Dogecoin blockchain. So now I have this address. Next thing I have to do is to get my own private key, which you will be able to see, but don't steal my Dogecoin, please. So here I'm on the Dogecoin uh, client, uh, and I will ask it to print my private key. And then I, I will use a tool to convert it to uh, to the Ethereum format. So, uh, dump the key of this address. So, this is the private key that sent the Dogecoin transaction. I'm going to copy this and I'm going to use a utility created for Rscape for to use, that is used to converting private keys and public keys. Uh, so, using the public, the, the private key, I just got, I get this address, which is an RSK address, but it uses the same format Ethereum use, so this is also an Ethereum address. So now I am going to uh, to go to the Dosh token contract that is uh, that you can see on Etherscan. I'm going to refresh my screen to get it updated. I'm crossing my fingers. Can you see my screen, right? Yeah. Yeah, we can see. Yeah. Oh, if if I, I hope that the private key there is, is 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 something you just created for this presentation, because otherwise we have to cut it out from the live from from don't, the don't worry. internet. I'm open to to lose forty dosh. <laughs> okay. Things of live presentation. Ether scan. It's taking its time. <laughs> All right. So uh, this is the tokens holder. So the people that uh, just uh, that already sent funds. So I'm going to search here for the address that I just got. So this is the address, and this are uh, this is 283 uh, milli tokens. Uh, so here I can verify that I got the, the tokens of the on the Dogecoin blockchain. Um, <laughs> ah, yeah, Pablo is the token transfers. Ah, yeah, okay, so here are the token transfers. So this, this is just me trying this several times to make sure that it works. Um, another thing you can see is if you go, this is a Dogecoin block explorer. I'm going to refresh in order to get the latest Dogecoin block. So it's 2 million and then see if that. Three nine three. If and this is the Dosh relay contract on Etherscan. If I refresh, I'm trying to check that the the Dosh the Dogecoin blockchain on Dosh relay is also updated. I'm on Etherscan not now. <laughs> Anytime there's a live demo, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's try this again. Well, working. Come on. Okay. Yeah. So it's three three hundred ninety three, and here three hundred three hundred ninety three. Well, good work. Oh, wow. Uh, so this is dot relay and dot token demo. Now I pass on to Sina to do a demo of the details of the script. Uh, interactive protocol. Okay, quick question before. So, are are you what are you are, are you constantly running? Uh, you are running a, a relay that was reading the uh, getting the hashes from the getting the latest block from Dodge and putting it on the on the on the contract, right? Yes. Maybe I didn't hear the question okay. properly. Yeah, that was it. no. Ah. Yeah, okay. Yes, there is an agent running all the time. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's it. 
you, you, you didn't mention that. You didn't know, no, you didn't mention or, or show that you, you were running that process. So it's just, uh, it's interesting well, to know. Nice, very uh, good. Yeah, this is, uh, this is the agent that, um, yeah, uh, the, yeah, uh, this is the, the agent that the dash from iteration is the one sending the, the information to dash relay. More questions or should I pass to Sina? Okay, Sina, go ahead. All right, so let's get into the demo of uh, interactive escort verification. So I'm going to share my screen again. Can everyone see it? Um, all right, so back to the GitHub repo. So this repo has all of the contracts and the client, which uh, you run locally on your computer to participate in the network. So um, we, uh, so I, I set up the demo beforehand, uh, just so, you know, because this process takes a while and there's time amounts of blocks that need to pass. So I'm going to kind of show you what we did earlier this morning. And uh, we sent you a video of the recording of this as it was happening, which is around 20 minutes long. So this first tab in my terminal to frame you is my local computer. Um, and um, basically I'm inside the Escript interactive repo. And uh, the client, as the client I do, I get the status of, of the client. So this connects to the bridge, says I have however much ether, um, I have this much ether deposited into the claim manager contract and this is my address. And uh, look this up on Rinkaby. So this is um, this particular address. Um, and then the next thing that I do is, um, the, so the client can really do two things. And back to the, back to GitHub, uh, we have this CLIJS, which you can refer to to really see what's possible. Um, there's the status, there's deposit with raw, and the, one of the core functionalities is claim. So this is where you submit a claim. Um, you pass in the block header, the hash, and the proposal ID. So uh, we basically um, created this uh, simple uh, mock for the Doge Relay contract that you're actually calling, and then it sends it over to the claim manager. So uh, back to my terminal, we see that we went npm start claim, and this is a serialized, uh, you know, Doge block header um, in plain text, quote unquote. And this is a wrong script hash. So we just made this up. And this is the proposal ID that you're passing in. So this says, um, as the claimant, I've connected to the, connected to the bridge. Uh, I create a claim. And then I'm waiting to defend the claim. So at this point, this would just kind of wait here until the number of blocks is passing. So I'll take you over to my second tab. Um, this is a separate machine. It's a digital ocean Ubuntu instance. And if we scroll up, basically I did NPM start status, um, you know, different address, different deposits. And I ran the client in monitoring mode with the auto challenge flag turned on. So this, this client is really the verifier in the system. And uh, it begins monitoring for claims. It sees a claim get created and uh, runs the escrow hash locally and sees that it's invalid. So at this point, the ch this challenger um, begins the process of enforcing the binary search. And the first step that they query is the midpoint of the entire uh, script process. So they query that, and then we go back to this hash. We see that. Uh, the claimant defense step 1024. And back to the second tab, um, we see that the session steps, it received, a, it received a response for 1024. It compares it with its own state. And in this particular case, um, they agree. So it queries for the midpoint of the second half. So this number is the midpoint of these two steps. So the verification game proceeds um, with the challenger querying for finer and finer slices of the computation. And uh, the back to the first tab, um, the claimant is responding with their state roots. And uh, finally, 
the ver the the verifier gets to um, queries for step twenty forty eight, which is because this is zero index, this is actually the, the you know the penultimate step, and uh, triggers this uh, and which triggers the execution of the code on chain, and we see that the claimant loses the game. So to kind of show you how this played out on. Uh, on Etherscan, uh, we actually have a .n file that has the addresses of all the all the deployed contracts. So the script verifier contract is um, back to the the script verifier is this one, where the verification game is happening. So we take this address, and um, I'll just open up a new tab. So we see that there's a bunch of transactions from, from earlier today. And if we, um, the next thing we're gonna do is go back to my terminal inside the window running as the claimant. I'm going to take their address um, and you know just do a control find. And we see that this is the game playing. And you know there's there's sometimes failed transactions I wish wanted to try again. So those types of things are are accounted for. So let's open up a few of these transactions. So we see that um, uh, we are calling the respond function. So this this tab was running the claimant. I made a claim, and basically after that, I'm responding with now to the next tab. You know, another respond, another respond. So um, we are. Um, we were the climate and we are responding at different steps. And uh, back to my second tab, um, we go all the way up here and we see that the challenger's address is this one. So, oops, uh, ring could be, and we paste in, or actually no, I wanted to look it up. I'll do a control find inside the script verifier contract, um, you know, contract source the verifier. Um, so we see that these are uh, transactions from the challenger. So let's open up a few of these. And um, we see that they're using, they're querying. So they're querying for consecutive steps. Um, and eventually when you get to step 2048, which is the final step, there's a query. And then this transaction is actually special. So this is the one that uh, looking at it, you say it says perform step verification, and inc it includes the pre-value, the post-value, the proofs, and um, the address of the claim manager because it's needed for uh, for the callback. Um, so that's that's in the case of the challenge, and then you know immediately after, further down in these files. Uh, so. Um, so here, so that was, we lost a game that was up here as the claimant. Then I submitted another claim, uh, the same uh, serialized block header. This time I passed in the correct script hash. So it creates the claim. It waits to defend the claim. And no challenges come in. So the claim is immediately successful. So back to the challenger window, um, we, we see, so here the, the, whoop, here the previous game ended. Uh, you know, ignore these, uh, these things will be washed over. But so it's still monitoring the, the contract and it sees a new claim got, uh, got created locally and sees that the script hash was valid. So it actually like doesn't proceed with a challenge. That's basically the system in effect. And, um, just, and the screen share. So all the all the contracts are deployed to Rinkeby, and there's directions for installing the client. It's a free entry system, so you can just start running it, start su like submitting um, script hashes with plain text, and uh, and or verifying. So we're looking forward to to people starting to play around with this. And hey, uh, an, actual, an actual live demo was included in that video that I sent. So. You can look at that one. Let's okay, so here's the question. You, oh, you don't need to keep the contract necessarily updated, yeah. right? You can, uh, so, 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 so let's say that the bridge isn't being very used and then, and, the, and, and then there's like only one or two persons 
in a single day that uses the bridge. Uh, you only need to to start verifying and keep the, the uh, and, and keep the dodge relay contract up to date with the latest blocks once you want to actually use it, right? So you can I can I can I can send the dodge and then start the whole process where I submit a block and then I, I submit the block to I submit I, and I submit the block to to to, to the verifier to so uh, make claims and etc. Right? Um, yeah, I'm going to to take that question. Um, the system that uh, that we designed it requires all dodge blocks to be relay to to dodge relay. Uh, it's not that you can stop relaying blocks and after three months you can start updating dodge relay with new blocks. Um, dodge relay is based on BTC relay for those of you that are familiar with it. So it needs every block in order to check that the, the dodge uh, blockchain is complete and there are no um, uh, yeah, there are not fake blocks. I don't know if that is the question. Yeah, but there, so at least there's a planned extension, at least I plan, <laughs> I would like to see that, where you do not submit every single block. You just submit a the latest block or um, a block further ahead from the last known block and then you have a again an interactive game where you show that it's uh, connected to the uh, last known block right uh yes that's that's correct and actually that's one of the main reasons it, it is like a beta and not a working system i'm going to share right away uh an issue that we have on our github that um, that basically discusses that problem and proposes two different solutions. I, let's say if I can pass it here. Uh, yeah, so I copy to the chat. So yeah, basically um, this is kind of uh, a solution to the problem that uh, the system currently, um, even though we are using uh, interactive script verification uh, still consumes a lot of gas per day. So um, basically we have an idea of how to solve that and it's written there. If we, we can discuss that uh, during the question and, out, and answer section later on. Christian, I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, it answer, answer mine. I think uh, it answer mine. Uh, shall we move to the summary and then to the questions, or is there anything else to? Uh, well, let's let's do the summary and, and go to questions. So, um, is my screen uh, share right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, to sum up, uh, the you can go and test. Uh, the, the 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 system. Uh, you, you can test the dodge relay on Robson, and you can test the, the script verification game in Rikabi. Uh I just sent a, man, a user manual before the presentation. I hope you received that. Uh, that explain how to do the same thing uh, that I just did. Uh, so basically, the system is composed of dodge relay, dodge token. Uh, the script, uh, the Trubit script interactive verification, and the related agent. Uh, so the next steps of the project will be to finish the Dosh to Ethereum side, and the, and implement the Ethereum to Dosh side. Uh, now uh, there is room for all the, you know, I, we you have already made a couple of questions, but now is a room to make the rest of the questions. Sorry, I think we can, uh, covered this one earlier. Can you remind me what happens if there's a, a uh, so a Dogecoin block is orphaned after someone submits a transaction uh, claiming Ethereum tokens? Am I correct in saying that the, there's a, is there a window in which it's, uh, to, is there a verification window? 
Yeah, so when you submit a, um, a Dogecoin transaction, uh, one of the checks that it is done is that the transaction is in uh, a Dogecoin block. Another check is to check that that block is part of the main chain. And the third check is that uh, the block where the transaction is included has at least n confirmations. n could be 100, 50, whatever number we finally decide. But that's the security model for that attack. I don't know if I answered the question or? Yeah, that, that's good, that's good. Um, I mean, a lot of this, I'm gonna have to go over the code. Um, I think I understand all of it uh, so far. I mean, how, yeah. How are you feeling about the whole Ethereum to Doge side? Because we're obviously going to need to do some new opcodes, and you know, how is that looking? Are you feeling confident about the whole thing? I mean, kind of in, in many ways. Like, do you need any help from us, actually? Uh, we will probably. Uh, so far, we. I mean, when I when we started the project, we thought that we will be done by now. <laughs> but uh, then we found out that. Um, yeah, let's first concentrate on finishing the Ethereum to Dogecoin side. Uh, so I share, uh, I, in, in the email I sent before, I share uh, a GitHub repo, a fork of Dogecoin, where we added a couple of new opcodes. Uh, this is not even an, an alpha, but it's uh, something that uh, we were working on. Um, and we, need, we don't need any help from you so far. As we make progress, we will for sure contact you and show you what we are building. I can cool. I can also add add to that. So on the Truebit side, we've been um, we've been we've been actually thinking through various ways that you could build the reverse peg without uh, without a hard or a soft fork on the Dogecoin side. And um, we've come up with with some crypto economic schemes, you know, leveraging Ethereum's ability to have smart contracts. And now, especially since we're available of the Dogecoin blockchain inside of the Stode Relay. So just to kind of share the very high level, you know, v, V1 of the idea that we've already evolved past, it would involve the operators of the bridge, whoever, you know, whoever's address is Doge is being sent to on the Doge side actually depositing ETH into the Doge Relay contract, so having stake. And then at that point, they're responsible for relaying transactions back and forth in a timely manner. So if someone burns their ETH Doge tokens on the Ethereum side, um, you know, this other timer starts, which, is, which says you have you know, 20 Doge blocks or 100 Doge blocks to submit another Doge Merkle proof showing that money went from the bridge address to the person's address. And um, that's and the idea has gone like a lot more interesting than that. Uh, we're working on a paper with Jason and Christian. So, uh, as another potential thing, like we're going to collaborate with Oscar on this. So we'll share that in the coming weeks as well. Well, uh, cool. I don't have any questions. I have a few comments. I think. I think it was a fantastic demo. I'm very glad to to, to see. I, I I had read about it, but uh, I think just seeing it in in action is is a whole other level, and it's interesting to watch. And I think it's clear to everyone that although although it's a uh, it, it is a funny it, it, it started as a funny project in a sense. Uh, it is a project that is much bigger than just being a Dogecoin Ethereum bridge, right? Because you can see there are. The, there are a lot of applications outside of the, the strict Dogecoin Ethereum community. It's it it helps a lot on Ethereum scalability. It can be built as a bridge with other currencies, which can help a lot. I think the whole ecosystem making uh, well, allowing smart contracts to be used in the ecosystem and allowing a, a lot of a lot more integration. And I'm very happy that it. This has been so far. I have a question for Christian. In fact, Christian, in fact, uh, Christian, is it? I I am under the impression that this the the Dodge Ethereum project was a little bit uh, precede the Truebit protocol, right? And I, if I'm, not, <laughs> if, if I'm not completely wrong, I believe that I I remember saying a few like 
that the oh. two was sort of inspired by a few early posts on Vitalik on how script verification could be done. So there is a connection between like the this whole process and Truebit, isn't there? Or am I am I missing something? Yeah, yeah. So the the history was that yeah, I think someone suggested the bridge. I don't remember who that was. And then I discussed with yeah, I think Vitalik made a proof of concept to verify a script with uh, basically repeated. Um, so just iteratively, so splitting up uh, a script across multiple blocks. And then I discussed with him how that might be improved using binary search. And in that discussion, we came up with the general idea, I think. And then Vitalik met uh, Jason at some conference and they talked about it. And it turned out that Jason Absolutely. basically had the same idea, right? Yeah, so in short, Truebit is a, is a solution to the Doge Ethereum bridge. That's, that's why we did it. <laughs> I'm very happy to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> and we're very excited to build an implementation of Truebit for this bridge. Uh, we've had, you know, versions of it on Testnet. Uh, but last night, you know, Sammy, who's also sitting here, so we're all living in this house in San Francisco, and Sammy actually went went home, and we played a verification game around 7 p.m. over the internet on Rinkby, which was, it was really cool. It was like a cool moment for the team. Awesome sharing this with you. Are there more questions? Uh, something I would like to comment on. So the... Um... I hope that is still the case. So I have to admit that I wrote most of the internals of this S-Script interactive uh, verifier, but I didn't have the time to participate in its further development over the past weeks and months. But um, it is written in a way such that, so um, the the on-chain part executes the, the final step to, to yeah, basically decide the game. Um, but um, during the game, the off-chain components always have to submit their internal state at certain steps of the computation. And um, it is written in a way such that the off-chain components use 99% uh, of the on-chain code to actually compute this state. And that hopefully makes it quite resistant to uh, yeah, so I mean, it's the same implementation, so there cannot be uh, conflicting, there cannot be kind of what you would call consensus bugs between the two implementations, uh, between the off and on chain part. Yeah, so to, to add to that, like it's actually super clever and blew us all away to see this original implementation. Um, yeah, you know, you're, the, you know, you're <laughs> exaggerating. <laughs> Script runner, like the thing that people use off chain to compute S script, is is the same code that the on chain contract uses. So at, inside of the client, you're actually running a an Ethereum client in dev mode that is executing stuff locally uh, as a pure function. So you're not writing anything to the blockchain, and you just run that locally, get the results back. But eventually, when you've narrowed it down to one step of the Salsa 8 uh, hashing function, the same code is actually used by the on-chain contract. So that's kind of to the internals of it. It's, uh, you know, you can, you can abstract that away, but it's, it's kind of cool that it ran that way. Um, so I was wondering, um, if you if you divide the whole process into like the 2050 iterations of Salsa 8, um, how likely is it actually that the the internal state diverts um, further out than like the first few iterations? 
like is it is it really needed to to do this binary search because it would be so, more likely for the computation yeah, to divert in the first iteration yeah so um if you know if someone is naively passing in a a you know hash it's likely that it will diverge early on you know and uh but if you're trying to build a protocol that actually that that is secure and can withstand any any type of attack that you put towards it, uh, doing a binary search over the steps of the computation is the fastest way you can get to get to the solution. So it's like log n in the in this in the number of steps n, which is 2050 in this case. Okay, so this you know we're is that a sophisticated attacker, you know, crafted a solution that uh, agreed and diverged, you know, eight steps down the line. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I got another question though. Um, Oscar, you've shown how the um, private key is generated from the input address of the Doge transaction. Um, what would happen for a transaction that has multiple inputs or like multiple dozen of inputs? Is it like just uh, on index zero? Uh, yes, the first input is the one as uh, the, the private key of the first input is the one that will get all the all the tokens. Okay. Cool. And maybe another one. Um, like, how would a hard fork of the Dogecoin blockchain play into this? Is this the same concept as a reorg, or would there be some different factors to take into account here? Um, the Doge relay will follow the chain with the heaviest proof of work. So, in okay. case of a hard fork, um, unless uh, the hard fork is super hard fork, meaning that it's incompat incompatible with the previous chain, which is probably very unlikely. But if you are still compatible with the previous chain, uh, Dosh Relay will just follow the chain with the highest, the highest proof of work. Yeah, I mean, it actually does make me think what would happen if we use if we switch the proof of work to SHA 256 or, or to some other random algorithm. Uh, I mean, is there any ability to update Doge Relay later on and bug fix it, or is it a fire and forget and pray it was never it was bug free at launch? Yeah. Uh, I think, I suppose we could we could we could hard fork the the contract itself, right? We could always deploy a new contract and and accept old tokens. All right. I think yeah. I would break the verifier too. <laughs> Yeah, that that's uh, yeah, that's correct. Uh, what Alex was saying uh, to answer the first question, Dosh Relay is not prepared to be updated as it is, as it is today. Uh, if you plan to change the proof of work algorithm, it will be a good idea to know about that soon. Uh, but uh, that's what that that's our state right now. Yeah, no plans for that right now. No worries. Yeah. Uh, no plans right now, uh, but yes, yeah, so some it may want to have some sort of complex, you know, six of nine signature uh, the thing that we can get a federated uh, update process if we absolutely have to. That you know, get the Dogecoin and the Ethereum and and devs from a number of other disparate organizations can get involved and apply bug fixes to the code if we absolutely have to, just so there is a backup in case of something. Cool. I do apologize. I have to run. Uh, it has been great, and have a great evening. Thanks, Ross. Thank you. Thank you. Well, me too. I think I, I will be disconnecting. Oh, well, thank you for this. Thank you for the demonstration. Uh, before we disconnect, maybe let's chat for just two minutes about next steps for the. Um, Robbie, you want to say something here? Uh, yeah, guys, uh, we just really, I guess, want to get this done as soon as possible and some guidance here would be helpful. So would it be possible to kind of set a date for the next meeting or think through, you know, how did you guys see the next steps unfolding? Okay, so here's here's how I see the next step unfolding. Uh, I would first, I, I, I would talk with the other judges to see if they, first, if they agree that this has been a good demonstration. In my opinion, it's a resounding yes. Uh, um, uh, the second step would be 
does that merit a 25% uh, of, of the total bounty? I I think that's subjective, but I I don't I, I like the calculation of half half and half, and I think that that would be fair unless someone someone has a, another roadmap where there is something that we really 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 need to to be, make sure that okay, so we really we we need let's say 10% to keep to 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 keep the contract running or something else. But other if there's no if there's no if there's no nothing against that I would initiate a transaction to 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 start uh, to pay the first step of the bounty as soon as there is and of course as soon as the, this video is published because I think it's it's nice to have the community know um, then the next step would be up to you and then you would be the one discussing on what what do you believe it is to like to be production ready and and. And so, so we can work on the next bounty, but that I think that would be a whole a, a whole new discussion, in my opinion. Okay, so we'll wait uh, on the response from the judges, and then we'll once that happens, we'll come back to you with you know what we think the milestones are for um, each Doge in production and a timeline. That sounds perfect to me. Awesome, thanks, guys. Sweet. Thank you, guys. Bye, bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Hey. See ya. Bye.